Well, I'm here at the Tekka Market at the beginning of the Sarangan Road, and I'm reliably informed that this gentleman here does a very fine line in breakfasts. And it's a story I'm very happy to believe in. Roti Parata, Singapore's answer to the croissant. Well, once I've uh, partaken of some very necessary nourishment, we're going to take a stroll round Little India, and then a very long walk up the Sarangoon Road. Be with you. Had Julian been having his roti prata here around 1840, he'd have been sitting in the middle of a betel nut plantation and would have been just about there. He probably would have been slapping mosquitoes away because not too far off towards Jalan Basar was a large mangrove swamp. So along with his morning coffee, he might also have copped a nasty dose of malaria. The plantations and farms lingered on beside what was then the Rocho River until the 1850s, before Indian cattle dealers moved in. These gentlemen found the abundant supply of water and grassland hereabouts an ideal environment for their livestock industry. Here they raised cows and buffaloes for the dairy trade, as well as for their widespread use as beasts of burden. As a consequence, the area became known by the Malay name of Kandang Kerbau, or cattle pens, and remained a livestock centre up until the mid-1930s. The local constabulary took on the name, and their headquarters was known as the Kandang Kerbau Police Station, demolished in 1978 to make way for where Julian's having breakfast. Ah, and there's the man himself. But before we depart the corner of Bukatima and Srangoon Roads, permit me to point out that it was here in 1948 where Singapore's very first set of traffic lights was installed. Not many people know that. You might suppose that because we're in Little India, this is going to be a program about all things Indian. But to be wrong, Hidden away in Kerbar Road, there's a little architectural gem that I first came across about 10 years ago, and I'm reliably informed that it's still there. Well, I'm glad to see that the house is still intact, though I have to say that the current uh, colour scheme leaves me feeling a trifle queasy. A bit like London's Carnaby Street in the 60s. Certainly in no way authentic. As I recall, the building when it was originally restored was a delicate pastel shade with a complementary trim. The house was originally built around 1900 for a Madame Chiu Hong Beng by her husband, who was a prominent businessman with lots of connections to Indonesia. One of their sons, Tan Simbo, was a very successful barrister before the war. Cambridge educated, with a brilliant legal mind, he was only the second Chinese advocate to appear in the Supreme Court. Sadly, he lost his life during the fall of Singapore when his ship went down off Pompong Island, bombed by Japanese planes. Promise unfulfilled, rather like this house, I fear, which was so beautifully restored some 10 to 15 years ago and has such fantastic original features, which nowadays have become all but obscured by these later additions. Now, this is a rather lovely roof terrace at the rear of the house, which in its day would have overlooked a garden. It really is rather a shame there's no garden there today. Madame Tio Hong Beng's house could sadly do with a little tender loving care. But as it happens, we're off to a place that actually specialised in tender loving care and of a rather different nature. Kandang Kerbau Hospital. The original Kandang Kerbau Hospital was built here in 1924. However, its facilities had difficulty coping with a rising birth rate following World War II. In 1953, the foundation stone was laid amidst much pomp and ceremony for the rebuilding of a vastly improved KK Hospital. And not a moment too soon. The birth rate at KK had passed 1,000 per month and was still rapidly climbing. 
By the 1960s, this figure had more than doubled because over 85% of all births in Singapore were taking place at Kandangkabau Hospital. The historical building now houses the Land Transport Authority. However, Julian's off to chat with a lady who well remembers it in its previous life. But back in the 50s, um, I have an impression that uh, it was quite hard to get people to come into hospital to have their children. They preferred to be at home. Yeah, true. Uh, the reason being culture. You yeah, know? yeah. And because I suppose uh, our Asian women those days uh, thought about uh, having home delivery, reason being uh, customary, and uh, they preferred to be with their family and loved ones yes. when they're going into labor. And also they thought labor was, uh, in those days, they. they they, 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 they believed that labor was something very tragic. Mm. Something will happen during labor. Right, yeah. So they felt secure del being delivered at home. Yes. And when was the sort of turnaround when people began to suddenly Somewhere around 1966. Really? Well, that was a particularly famous year, I believe. Yeah, it is. Oh. And uh, we sort of uh, had about 39,000 odd children, children delivered, delivered during the In a time. single year. That's right, All in, in a single game. year. It's a pride for KK because we went into the Guinness Book of Records. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, what was it like in the, the, that time? You had to work triply hard. If you don't mind me saying, we had to really slog it out. I'm sure, yes. And uh, every shift, meaning 7 to 2, yes. 2 to 9, yeah. and uh, 9 to 7.30. Yes. And each shift, we delivered around about 30, 40 babies. Actually, this is quite a record. Well, well, as it happens, I'm reliably informed that our sound man here is one of the record-breaking 39,000. Wow, that's nice. And I need to shake your hand. <laughs> Congratulations, I'm, Jeremy. I'm proud that you delivered you. <laughs> maybe, delivered maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe I would have delivered you, Jeremy. He looks a bit different now, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yes. that was quite a year. I mean, the, the, the number of babies wasn't the only problem. Was the floods or something like yes, that? Yes, uh, during right. the time we were delivering babies under torchlights because one moment during that period we had a flood mm -hmm. which washed away all our lighting system. And uh, we had to share beds because uh, the cases were pouring in and we didn't have sufficient beds to accommodate patients. Yes. And uh, we had to transfer babies in long trolleys, about three, four, five, five, five of them, because we were short of staff. <laughs> that must have been quite a yeah. saga, really. Yes. We should make a film about it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right. Kandang Karaba Hospital in the Guinness Book of Records for the most babies born in a single hospital in a single year. Should we perhaps be trying to better this record, I wonder? Consider this during the break. I'll be back. Little India, straddling the top of Srangoon Road, is one of Singapore's most perfectly preserved historical suburbs. A front runner in the National Heritage Stakes, right up there alongside Kampong Glam and Katong. Take a stroll through one weekend and you'll see what we mean. The name Little India is slightly misleading because there's a harmonious mix of architectural styles and historical sites on every street. Hindu temples would of course be expected. However, they share the suburb with stately Christian churches as well as with beautifully restored mosques. As we venture further along Srangoon Road, we arrive at the site of an event that was tragic in the extreme. Here once stood the Lian Yak building, which housed the 67-room Hotel New World, and on its ground floor, the Industrial and Commercial Bank. It wasn't as if there'd been no indication of the disaster to come. A low and ominous crackling had been heard in the basement nightclub in the days before, but the implications hadn't been realized. It was, in fact, the structural failure of these support columns that triggered the catastrophe. On the 15th of March, 1986, at around 11.25 a.m., the six-story building abruptly collapsed into a pile of unrecognizable rubble and twisted steel. Had this disaster occurred only a few hours earlier, the casualty rate would have been horrific. The Civil Defence Force, the Singapore Armed Forces and the Fire Brigade quickly had units on the spot. The expectation was initially that few, if any, survivors could be expected, considering the scale of the disaster. Rescue efforts were immediately mounted and were assisted by tunnelling experts, 
Britain, Ireland and Japan who were employed on the construction of the MRT underground rail system. Thanks to their tireless efforts, 17 people were pulled alive from the wreckage. Sadly, 33 others were beyond help, having perished in the initial collapse of the building. It was later learned at the Commission of Inquiry, which was set up to investigate the disaster, that a combination of under-design, shoddy workmanship and corner cutting on the part of the building contractors had all helped to bring about the collapse of the 15-year-old building. As a result, building regulations were considerably tightened and stringent inspections were introduced to ensure that a tragedy of this magnitude could not happen again. Now you wouldn't expect to find something like this on the margins of Little India, would you? A French store. Remarkable. Remarkable? Well, yes, but just coincidentally, the French stall is rather appropriately positioned if one briefly considers a map of the location. The British, when they named the streets in this area, did so out of respect for their French allies during World War I. And so we have Flanders, a battle site shared by French and British forces. The Marne, a river in France and also a battle site. Pétain, a rather important French general, and his compatriot Foch, who was also an heroic military figure, concluding with the Somme, site of one of the war's bloodiest engagements. Some of the Great War's notable British admirals and generals have been thrown in for good measure. Amongst them, General Allenby, a personal friend of the legendary Lawrence of Arabia. Not many people know that. While still on the subject of street names, here's one that's worthy of our consideration. Lavender Street. Now, how did it come by its name? Did it perhaps once run through fragrant fields of lavender? Not so. Quite the opposite, in fact. This location was once the site of many acres of Chinese market gardens, which not only produced vegetables, but an incredible stench. They were fertilized with human waste. Night soil regularly collected from houses in the nearby neighborhood. And so it seems that some long forgotten civil servant with a rather wicked sense of humor, it might be said, decided upon the name Lavender Street for this pungent thoroughfare. Clearly the more obvious and more accurate choice of name was quite unacceptable. And on that note, I think it's time for a break. A little further along Sarangoon Road, I came to something really rather special. Good for you, Julian, but you'd better enlighten us. Whatever you've got in mind here doesn't appear to be on our list of national heritage sites, I can tell you. Just at present, I can't quite think how this building is going to fit into our series, except to say that it's old, it's still here, and it looks more or less untouched from when it was first built, which I would imagine was the mid to late 30s or perhaps just after the war. Certainly it's a magnificent example of tropical deco architecture. I particularly like the sculpted end there with, of course, the ubiquitous flagstaff. Every deco building worth its salt had to have one of those. Anyway, let's go inside and take a look. The National Aerated Water Company Limited. Sounds fascinating. Has Julian been out in the sun a little too long, I wonder? He's taken us to a lot of fascinating places, but I'm yet to be convinced that this is one of them. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt, shall we? Wow, now this is something really extraordinary. The PC office, and by that, I mean the pre-computer office. Look at all that paperwork. Oh, there's a gentleman just gone in there. How many of you remember your office being like this? Wow, this uh, chair is a museum piece in its own right. Our man with the hat is certainly full of surprises, and I must admit that I'm quite enjoying this one. What an amazing place. Oh, we even have uh, an abacus as a standby. Absolutely fabulous. I feel like I've uh, stepped into the past. 
One feels that the uh, whole interior should be preserved as some sort of sociological exhibit of uh, mid-20th century office planning. Ah, a clue to past glories. A bottle of Peacock brand. The last of the line. Oh, well, this is obviously where all the uh, bottling took place, but I have to say it looks a trifle dodgy. I'd hate to die beneath an avalanche of Sinalco bottles. Living history is a rare find in 21st century Singapore. And though not everyone would agree that the aerated water company should be given a heritage listing, it's rather comforting to find that such places do still exist. And a very good afternoon to you. In the meantime, Julian's off to find out whether another site still exists further up Sarandun Road, one considerably older than the aerated water company. You may recall that we dropped by here on a couple of occasions in the previous series, the Bidanari Christian Cemetery. I had hoped that this rather splendid gateway will be preserved and somehow incorporated into the new housing development that is due to be built on this site. But alas not, it's gone and with it just about everything else. Just three years ago, where departed souls once rested at peace, lazy and contented cats also rested at peace. Doubtless well aware that a tasty bit of lunch was close at hand if they could be sufficiently bothered to do something about it. The Bidadari Christian Cemetery was unfortunately far too beautiful, far too large and, as real estate, far too valuable to survive the 20th century. Within its confines stood at least a hundred tombstones that qualified as works of art and another hundred that were final and physical testament to the lives of historical figures of all races. Fortunately, there's no doubt that these have been preserved and will eventually reappear elsewhere. And very shortly, I too will appear elsewhere. I'm making a detour off Sarangoon Road down Braddle Road to a site that has less to do with history and more to do with nostalgia. Bear with me and all will be revealed. Now many years ago there was a huge stand of snake infested bamboo growing right on this corner. And on the other side of the road there was a camp off with chickens and ducks and enormous pigs whose bellies dragged in the dirt as they snuffled along. I know this because up until the age of six, this was my home. Follow me. It appears we're off down memory lane with Julian again. Or, to be more precise, down Linwood Grove, past a rather unfortunate fence, I might add. The guard dog makes a token display of disapproval and retires to its kennel, duty done. And it's a hot day after all. Ah, the Davison family residence in all its glory. In its fundamentals, it hasn't really changed all that much. So there wasn't any glass in the windows in those days. We had louvered shutters. It wasn't this porch, obviously. It was a low parapet wall and an open patio. That was the dining room. That was my bedroom over there. There were a lot more uh, shrubs and, and then flowering plants in the garden. My mother was a very keen gardener. But um, otherwise, yeah, I mean, it's recognizably the same place. Quite extraordinary. And of course, on the other side of the fence there, there was a, a camp on and uh, it wasn't a brick wall, it was a bamboo hedge and the children from the camp on used to collect crickets and grasshoppers to feed to the songbirds. And um, I used to spend quite a lot of time on the other side of the road and I remember Chinese New Year, the firecrackers going off, couldn't sleep for three or four days. <laughs> long ago and far away, and yet it doesn't really seem that long ago or that far away. Time seems to have treated my old house kindly. Well, at least it's still standing. However, time is pressing for us, 
So whilst I find a taxi, why don't you take a look and see what we're up to next week? It might be all high-rises today, but it was farms and plantations a hundred years ago. Next week in An Island Farm and Beasts That Harm, Julian's checking out what used to make a profit before we discovered the stock market, and where food came from before we discovered the supermarket. Back to the days when animals ate us instead of us eating them. I think I prefer the present arrangement. And it looks like Julian's got a meal of his own in mind. I've been dreaming of a little Samo Mariné Peut-être avec un peu d'épinage, huile d'olive citronnée, if you'll pardon my French, ever since we passed this intriguing eatery earlier on in the day. So I hope you'll forgive me for indulging myself in a meal which is not exactly Singaporean in the stricter sense of the word, though I should point out that one of the pleasures of living in modern Singapore is the fact that there's not a single cuisine in the whole world which cannot be found somewhere on this island. I'm convinced of that. Whatever. Certainly, this French stall is a marvellous discovery. Merci beaucoup. Well, I don't know what you've got on the menu for tonight, but I sincerely hope that it's as good as this. So until next week, salut et bon appétit. Well, I'm at here. Oh, why am I saying I'm at here? I don't know why, sorry. I'm here at. <laughs> so whilst I look for a cab, no. Cab? Why am I saying cab? And I shouldn't be looking. Ah, here comes my dinner, and I have to say that it looks absolutely delicious. Salut et bon appétit.